Hello there, my name is Siobhan Fallon. I'm an author and a military spouse, and I'm working on a new book. And while I was researching this book, I took a trip to Monroe, Michigan. Uh, one of the highlights of Monroe, and one of the reasons I went to Monroe, is the Custer Equestrian Statue. Uh, I remember driving all day to get from where I live in Pennsylvania to Monroe, Michigan, and I was just trying so hard to get there before dark and might have been speeding a little bit. And uh, I drove straight to the statue just as the sun was setting behind it, and it lit it up in just fire. It was magnificent. So I am not a historian. I just wanted to share a little bit with you guys today about the history of the equestrian statue and also why this statue in particular is important to the history of Monroe. So thank you so much for watching um, and let's get started. So if George Armstrong Custer was born in New Rumley in Ohio and he died at the Little Bighorn Battlefield in Montana why is there a statue of him in Monroe, Michigan? Let's find out. Yes, Custer was born in New Rumley, Ohio on December 5th, 1839. And that's his little baby dress. His family originally moved to Monroe in 1842 when Custer was about two and a half years old or so, but they lived there maybe six months before returning to Ohio. However, Custer's older half-sister, Lydia Ann, met the Monroe man she would later marry. You could argue that Custer's half-sister's marriage changed history. We won't ever know what would have happened to Custer if he stayed in Ohio, but by becoming a Michigan boy, he brought great fame to his adopted hometown and state. So Custer would live intermittently with Lydia Ann and Monroe from the ages of 10 to 16, uh, sometimes he'd attend school in Monroe in the winter and then return to Ohio to help his dad out on his farm and blacksmith shop in the summer. Uh, Custer would go to West Point and he graduated with the class of 1861, just in time to fight with the Union Army in the Civil War. But George Armstrong Custer would make his biggest mark, leading the Michigan Brigade. <laughs> <laughs> Though there were short periods of time when other regiments were attached, the Michigan Brigade was mostly made up of the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th Michigan Cavalry. The Michigan Brigade fought in every major campaign of the Army of the Potomac, from the Battle of Brandy Station in June of 1863 all the way to the Confederate surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in April 1865. The Michigan Cavalry Brigade suffered the heaviest casualties of any Union cavalry in the Civil War. And they first gained national fame at Gettysburg under the leadership of the, at that time, America's youngest Brigadier General of the U.S. Volunteers, George Armstrong Custer. Custer rushed ahead of his outnumbered troops and he urged them on with, come on you Wolverines. And though they suffered heavy casualties, the Michigan Brigade is credited with stopping Wade Hampton's Confederate Brigade and forcing them to withdraw. After the victory at Gettysburg, Custer's name was forever closely linked with Michigan. While on leave on February 9th, 1864, Custer married Elizabeth Bacon the lone surviving child of Daniel Bacon, a judge and leading citizen of Monroe. After the wedding, Custer quickly returned to the front line and Elizabeth, known as Libby, always stayed as close as possible to the fight in order to be near her husband. After the Confederate surrender at Appomattox, General Sheridan used the $20 gold piece he kept on his person in case of capture to buy the table on which General Ulysses Grant had drafted the surrender terms. Sheridan then gave that table to Libby Custer with the note, there is scarcely an individual in our command who has contributed more to bringing about this desirable result than your very gallant husband. After the Civil War, Custer was sent to the Deep South in an effort to maintain peace during the Reconstruction period. 
Then with his newly created 7th Cavalry, he was sent out west from Texas to Kansas and eventually to the Dakotas. Custer's life ended 11 years after the Civil War on June 25, 1876, when he and more than 250 of his men died at the Battle of the Little Bighorn in a fight against the Lakota and the Northern Cheyenne. Soon after Custer's death, there were attempts to memorialize him. The first was a statue erected at West Point in 1879 that Libby Custer really, really did not like. <laughs> there was another Custer statue erected in the mining town, Custer City, Colorado, in 1902. And then much later, there would be a Custer statue at the very site of Custer's birthplace in New Rumley, Ohio. And that was in 1932. But I'm sure all of you are noticing sort of a key ingredient to being a cavalry officer that's missing in all of these statues. Yes. <laughs> well, Libby's hometown of Monroe, Michigan was about to remedy that. In 1906, the Ladies Civic Improvement Society was a powerful group in Monroe. They initiated a progressive agenda to beautify and clean the city, purify water, preserve Monroe history, and set the stage for future women's rights. Their efforts are still visible around Monroe today. Charles Greening was a Monroe citizen, community leader, and president of the Greening Nursery Company. With the support of the Civic Improvement Society, Greening began the campaign for a Custer Equestrian statue. Meanwhile, in Almost simultaneously, the Michigan Cavalry Brigade Association <laughs> they independently began to lobby the Michigan legislature to also erect an equestrian monument to George Custer. So all the parties decided to combine their efforts and they agreed that the monument should be placed in Monroe. This was supported by Governor Fred Warner who said, if a monument is erected, the proper place for it is at Custer's home city, Monroe. In 1907, the Detroit Free Press announced, the citizens of Monroe have taken up in earnest the matter of a monument to be erected in the city of Custer's adoption. Monroe hosted a concert to raise funds. Some of the tickets are selling for as high as $5 and are being readily gobbled up by those anxious to perpetuate the memory of Michigan's valiant soldier. Governor Warner signed a bill creating the Monument Commission and appropriating $25,000 for the project. Three veterans of the Michigan Cavalry Brigade who had served with General Custer were appointed. Colonel George Briggs of Grand Rapids who had commanded the 7th Michigan Cavalry, General James Kidd of Iona who commanded the 6th Michigan and later the entire brigade, and Lieutenant Fred Nims of Monroe who had begun as a sergeant in the Civil War and eventually became a lieutenant with the 5th Michigan Cavalry. He had also been a personal friend of Libby since childhood, and his house is still standing in Monroe today. Now, the committee wanted Libby to play a very active role in everything. George Custer's younger sister, Maggie, like Libby, who had been raised in Monroe, she advised Libby that the statue should show Custer at the age and period when he represented Michigan the commission agreed. The statue would portray Custer when he led his first command, the Michigan Brigade, against Stewart's Cavalry at the Rummel Fields of Gettysburg. So as we touched upon earlier, the horse <laughs> is obviously a key ingredient to the cavalry as well as to an equestrian statue. Libby was quoted as saying to the Detroit News, there's a bronze horse in Washington whose modeling is such that were his rider to return to earth, he would be justified in dismounting and even changing his branch of service to the infantry. <laughs> so Libby knew how incredibly important it was to choose the right sculptor. She was also in touch with Mrs. Irene Rucker Sheridan, the widow of General Sheridan, who had warned Libby and told her about a Sheridan equestrian statue that was supposed to be Sheridan in his prime, 
but actually made her husband look older than he did when he died. The Monroe Committee reviewed the best artistic talent in America, and they put together a list of over 20 sculptors who are interested in this project. Renowned Western artist Frederick Remington was on that list. So is James Earl Frazier. This is so crazy. So James Earl Frazier's father worked for the railroads, and he was one of the men sent to recover the remains of George Armstrong Custer at the Little Bighorn Battlefield in Montana in 1877. You think that alone would have given the guy the job, but he didn't get it. Another sculptor who was very eager for the position was Vinnie Ream. She was famous for her life-size marble statue of Abraham Lincoln that's still in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol today. Ream had been the youngest artist and the first woman to receive a commission as an artist from the United States government. She was also a personal friend of George Armstrong Custer. She begged Libby for this commission, but she had never done an equestrian statue before and she too did not get the job. In the end, the committee chose Edward Clark Potter. The Monroe Democrat newspaper wrote, there are 83 equestrian statues in the world, while of these, Potter has erected three. What really impressed Libby is that Potter wanted to come out and visit Monroe to see where the statue was going to go. She appreciated his going the extra mile, literally. So General Briggs, who was sort of in charge of the Monument Commission, he looked at all of the sketches that Potter had made. And General Briggs was especially taken by this position of the horse and how it symbolized the moment that Custer sighted the enemy and pulled his horse to a halt so that he could plan the course of action. I think it's a really interesting portrayal because we think uh, of Custer as being sort of impulsive and reckless and fast and moving. And this is a very deliberate portrayal of a commander who is in control. Um, there's a posture of stillness. You just feel like he's rational and he's has a whole overview of the battlefield and he's got a plan. The statue was made from huge melted down bronze war cannons that were at the U.S. Navy Yard and they had been captured from foreign battlefields, mostly Spain, which of course saved them a ton of money, but also it's just incredible. It just contributes to the historical importance of it all. I mean, it's a, a war statue made from war artifacts, so it's really nice uh, recycling. It was decided that the scale of the statue would be heroic size, and that means it was one and one third life size. That was sort of a popular statue type at the time. The Monroe Democrat said that the 14 foot statue was quote, came in eight pieces and was hoisted onto place after the body of the statue had been erected. In all, it weighed 7,000 pounds. The statue is considered one of the finest equestrian statues in the country. Uh, here's one anecdote that I really love. Libby Custer said that the village blacksmith in Monroe pronounced the shoeing of the general's horse perfect. So it's kind of a nice touch and showing how meticulous Potter was. When you read the Monroe Democrat articles leading up to the unveiling, the excitement is just contagious. Everything is in anticipation of this big event. News of the unveiling had been carried in 6,000 newspapers across America. One thing that I would see again and again was how conscious the planners were of wanting to complete the statue quickly so Civil War veterans would still be alive to see it. One soldier wrote, 
You are well aware that time is fast doing his work, and there remains only a short time for the youngest of us. Well, the statue was completed, and a lot of veterans were able to attend. 400 members of the Veteran Brigade Association arrived in Monroe, and the residents of Monroe just opened up their doors and let strangers stay with them. So beautiful, including Custer's own niece and the best man at his wedding. The Mother Superior at St. Mary's Academy offered lodging for 32 veterans. Monroe ordered 150 additional cots to put in homes so that they could welcome in more veterans. It's just incredible that they were just welcoming these soldiers who were strangers into their homes. The night before the unveiling, a reporter wrote, everything is in readiness for the reception of the men who fought with Custer, who will gather here in force tomorrow for their annual reunion. Perhaps the last big reunion many of them will attend, and for the unveiling of the statue of their beloved commander. President Taft arrived at 9 a.m. and his first speech was delivered to the students of St. Mary's College and Academy for Women. Then the president watched the parade of veterans from Monroe Street. These aging veterans, more than 40 years after the Civil War, they lived on tiny pensions. They were crippled by war and age. They had come from all over just to be there. The president followed this parade to the Veiled Monument. He sat on the grandstand with Governor Warner, also Monroe, Mayor Martin, Charles Greening, and three women from the Civic Improvement Society. And of course, also on the grandstand was Libby Custer. President Taft said, from Bull Run to Appomattox and every bloody battle of the Army of the Potomac, Custer was the right arm of the commander of the forces of the leader of the Cavalry Corps and of the Cavalry Brigade. He showed in his life that same worth and force that we have in most of the great military commanders of the world. The president commented about how the country ought to be proud of their small army as well as army wives, who also faced the perils and dangers of the frontier. And he pointed out that Libby was a prime example of such an army wife. I can't help but really liking that he did that and took a moment to acknowledge her as president of the United States in her hometown. So I like you, Taft. Elizabeth Custer unveiled the monument. And you could see right there in that upper left photo with a large draping flag that's hiding the Custer Equestrian Monument. So there's two huge flags on either side. And uh, Libby was really nervous as she pulled the yellow ribbon. Yellow, of course, being the cavalry color. She was very relieved when the huge flags swung apart smoothly and floated down on each side of the monument. The crowd went wild. The band played the Star Spangled Banner and there was a 17 gun salute. At the close of the ceremony, the band played America and a chorus of 75 young women sang the Old Brigade in tribute of all the veterans of the Michigan Cavalry Brigade many of them standing there with bowed heads, distinguished by their red neckties. This is when the special train for President Taft moved slowly through the crowd and halted just west of the statue. You can see the train there. And if you look really close, you can see a little tiny President Taft at the end of it. The president boarded the train and he departed and he waved to the crowds as he left. Approximately 3,000 Monroe County residents, 11% of the total county population served in the Civil War. 14% of those soldiers died. That's over 400 young men just from Monroe County alone. 400 men who lost their lives in an effort to preserve the Union and abolish slavery. 
That brings us to Soldiers and Sailors Park. This is the oldest park in Monroe County, dating from 1909, and it was created by the Monroe Ladies Civic Improvement Society, who we talked about a little bit earlier. It was originally called Riverside Park, but the name was changed in 1923. In 2012, private citizens of Monroe created this incredible monument to Monroe's fallen. Another local Monroe hero, Norman Hall, was also instrumental at Gettysburg. His brigade rushed in as reinforcements when there was a critical breach in the line and they helped repulse Pickett's charge. Norman died too young at the age of 30. Thomas Ward Custer, George Custer's younger brother, is also recognized here. Tom Custer is the highest decorated Union soldier in the Civil War, and he was the only soldier in that war, the first person in American history to receive the Medal of Honor twice. There were eight Civil War Medal of Honor recipients from Monroe County alone. This is a really beautiful park. And as a member of the military community myself, I'm just I'm so grateful to Monroe for not forgetting your veterans. So we saw a lot of photos from 1910 of the Acosta Equestrian statue and where it was originally placed across from the courthouse in Laranger Square. There you go. There's another one. Uh, there was increased automobile traffic though, so they decided to move the statue to Soldiers and Sailors Park that we just saw some slides about, and that's right on the River Raisin. And that was in 1923 that it was moved. 1955, they decided to move the statue again. And this time, it was rededicated and it was put at its current location now on Elm Avenue and North Monroe Street, which is pretty central in the town and I think it's a, just a lovely spot. If you want to follow in the footsteps of the Custers, there's still so much more to see in Monroe. A good place to start is the Monroe County Museum. They have a really excellent exhibit on the Custers and their legacy with tons of artifacts. And that's me standing in front of George Custer's desk. Um, throughout this presentation, you probably have noticed a bunch of photos of artifacts from the lives of the Custers. And I took a lot of those photos on my visit to the Monroe County Museum. There's also the wonderful Ellis Library Custer Collection that uh, a lot of it was started by Dr. Frost, who was once a mayor of Monroe. He had a tremendous collection. A lot of it were the papers of Libby Custer. And even if the originals are not there, they still have just a great archive of copies of Libby's letters and books and some mementos. And it's definitely worth stopping there if you too are doing any research into the lives of the Custers. The Woodland Cemetery is one of Michigan's oldest public cemeteries. It's the final resting place of pioneers, distinguished citizens, and veterans from every U.S. military conflict from the Revolutionary War to Vietnam. There's a large Custer Reed plot where George Custer's youngest brother Boston and his nephew Autie Reed are buried. You remember the Reeds, uh, Lydia Ann. Autie is her son, and he died with Boston, with their family members at the Battle of Bighorn. So the Custer family suffered great losses that day. James Calhoun, who was mar married to Maggie Custer Calhoun, Tom Custer, George Custer, Audie Reed and Boston Custer all fell on June 25th, 1876. Uh, the Custer family has lived in Monroe, continued to live in Monroe, and also continued a tradition of distinguished military service. Uh, Colonel George Custer III, who served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and Colonel Charles Custer, who served in World War II and Korea, are also buried at the Woodland Cemetery. And there are so many distinguished citizens of Monroe at that cemetery. It's just an incredible who's who if you get a chance to walk through there.
There's also more to Monroe than the Custers. There are these outstanding historical markers all over the city. Some of them go back to the Ladies Civic Improvement Society, and some are a lot more recent and just like a fantastic roadmap to the history of Monroe. There's Heck Vietnam Veterans Memorial Park, which is another lovely green space dedicated to veterans. Again, I wanna thank Monroe for continuing to honor their heroes. There's the new River Raisin National Battlefield Park, which is just state of the art. It's really a beautiful space. It commemorates the Remember the Raisin fight of the War of 1812. Um, there are a lot of influential citizens of Monroe. One is painter Robert Duncanson of Monroe, who was known as the best landscape painter of the West. Also, children's author Elizabeth Upham McWeb, and uh, she's famous for her Little Brown Bear books. And there's a statue of Little Brown Bear outside of the Dorsch Memorial Library. In 1941, the premiere of the motion picture, They Died With Their Boots On, was shown at Monroe's local theater, which is now called the River Raisin Center of the Arts. At that time, seven members of the Custer family attended that premiere. Uh, and lots of local businesses in Monroe, I'm sure they could use your support. One of them is Martin's Shoe House, which is wild. Custer bought his boots there and they are still in business. And now you can go in and buy your kids school shoes. So lots of history to Monroe. Wow, you made it. Thank you so much. Thanks for hanging in and lasting. Um, that's a photo from my trip to Monroe. That's the picture I took of the Custer Equestrian statue that first night when I drove in and caught the sun setting behind it. I'd like to thank everyone who helped me put this together, including especially Dave Ingle and Dale Kozman who are friends and they're really knowledgeable about Monroe and the Custer family story. Um, they also looked at these slides and found a lot of mistakes. So thanks guys. Um, if you want to read more, I recommend anything by Dr. Frost. Those three books of his that I list right there on the screen, uh, they focus on the Custer equestrian statue and on Libby Custer. And I relied on them heavily putting this together. Um, also, there's a pamphlet there about the Woodland Cemetery that's a wonderful, gives um, quick bios of everyone who's buried there, and it's just a lot of influential people from Monroe, so it's a great reference guide for you to have. Um, wait, please like and subscribe. Yes, please. Uh, I really appreciate it. If you have a second, and I need positive reinforcement, and I'm thinking of doing more of these, so give me a little thumbs up. You can really, really use it. Okay. Yay. Thanks guys. Hopefully see you again.